Okay, good afternoon. My name is Kathy Marr, and I am not a podium hugger. So, <laughs> I'm live action, so you gotta watch. Um, thank you so much, David, for uh, asking this panel to be here today. Um, again, I'm Kathy Marr, I'm the director of the Barnum Museum, and immersed in our own reinterpretation, reimagination of a old 19th century story about a dead white guy. Some of you probably have that situation too, and there's so much more than that. Um, but before we begin, I also want to thank David for, uh, y you never want to be the person that follows Keith Stokes, uh, <laughs> by the way, thank you for that. Um, and also, because we have a extraordinary panel here today, you also don't want to be the person in charge of strict enforcement of a timed storytelling panel. Um, so we've all got about five minutes. I think Phil had mentioned that today. So I'm going to usher everybody along because these stories are extraordinary. One thing that really puts me out of my comfort zone is being on script. But um, there are extraordinary bios um, that I want to read about who you're going to listen to today. So if you don't mind suffering through me uh, as I read the bios, Maisa, who just left the stage, um, <laughs> is, as uh, Keith had mentioned, the president of the Mary uh, and Eliza Freeman Center for History and Community in Bridgeport. Um, founded in 2009, which is so recent considering the relevance of this history, the Freeman Center owns and is restoring uh, the Freeman houses, which happen to be the oldest remaining uh, buildings built by African American women in 1848, so these are significantly important, not just Bridgeport, not just Connecticut, but these are national historic landmarks that need to be recognized. Um, but listed on the National Register of Historic Places for their significance uh, of African American women, the Freeman Houses are the last original buildings of historic Ethiopia, later called Little Liberia. Um, the Freeman uh, Center seeks to establish an African-American historic site and national importance consisting of a museum, an education center, and housing. Um, Maisa has been an advocate for historic preservation as well as the Freeman Houses since uh, 1994 and is a trustee of the Connecticut Trust for Historic uh, Preservation and has truly been one of my muses uh, for many years and I am so honored to be here with you. Um, but I also want to introduce the other panelists before we begin this conversation. Catherine? Catherine, there she is. Grew up in Los Angeles, that's okay. That's okay, I'm a New Yorker. Basically aware of her family's significance, uh, significant contribution to World War II. That changed when she discovered hundreds of letters written during the war. All the letters were saved by her mother, Eva Lee Brown, in South Carolina. Eva Lee, Eva Lee threw nothing out. I'm sure we all know that. That's how museums exist. People don't throw things away. But she even saved the love letters of her husband's old girlfriends, all Rosie the River, Riveters. Stuck, uh, struck by the elegance of the language and the poignancy of the stories, she set herself to turn the letters into plays and programs. Over the year, years, Others lent letters of their loved ones who served as well. Catherine is the graduate of Mills College and Harvard University. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, Ivy Leaguers here today. I, I did my work at NYU, so I'm not quite uh, at that level. But Bonnie, hi, uh, is a lead instructor with the Moth Corporate and Community Programs and produces comedy and storytelling shows. Uh, she co-founded the Nag Nagata Comedy Festival hosted by WGC Radio uh, show Anything Goes with Kim and Bonnie, and hosts Connecticut's story-based storytelling show, The Story Barn, currently in its ninth year. Her stories have been featured on the Central Park Summer Stage, The Moth Podcast, The Moth Radio Hour. Bonnie's children have threatened to defriend her on Facebook if she tells any more stories <laughs> about them. <laughs> and Shauna Melton, here she is. Again, you get to hear Shauna again. We're so fortunate. Is an award-winning poet, painter, and art consultant. She curates poetry stages throughout the tri-state area while performing and exhibiting her work. Shauna also facilitates workshops, including the Writers Group in Bridgeport, a monthly group that gathers at City Lights Gallery. And Suzanne is over here today. As a resident of Bridgeport, she is dedicated to creating platforms that enhance the vis visibility of creative work and exists 
in a thriving community. She, her most recent publication is the unraveling, uh, is unraveling my thoughts. So with that, thank you all for being here today. Um, when David actually asked me to be on the program and then later to facilitate it, my initial reaction was, I'm a student. I'm a student of Keith Stokes. I listen to my ASA. I need to learn these stories and how to tell the Barnum story, an 1893 museum represented by P.T. Barnum in a more engaging and enriching way. So I needed to hear them and be part of the charrettes and the discussions so I can take a very linear story, which has been accepted and tried and true, and expand it to tell a much more three-dimensional. We don't, li history didn't happen in a vacuum. Nothing is neat and clean and pretty. It's messy, lives are messy. And we needed at the Barnum to bust out of that and confront the hard stories, the lesser told stories, to give people today an opportunity to immerse and enrich in who we were, which is really illuminating who we are today and who we will be in the future. And to honor history fully and fairly, we need to bring all of those stories in. So with that, the Barnum Museum, fortunately, in a funny kind of way, uh, has gone through a major re-envisioning as a result of natural disasters. Our history is still growing. But it gave us the opportunity to say, it's time to change it up. Who are we today? This is a 21st century audience that we're facing, as Keith was just saying. We don't learn the same way. We have opportunities to have more enriching stories uh, in our lives that connect us emotionally. It's not an object and a case anymore. That's all fine, and that's well and good, and we can digitize, and you can go online, and you can pull up the data and the metadata, yawn, okay? But how do you reach into the heart and soul of somebody and make them part of an immersive journey? So this is literally what we're doing, and as I said, you know, we are taking the 19th, well, is, has anybody seen the Greatest Showman movie yet? Okay? Nothing is true. <laughs> Nothing. I had the fortune, uh, fortune to go to the opening in New York, and it was terrific. And they, 20th Century Fox told us, we're not doing a documentary. This is about capturing the spirit and the fun and the flavor of what entertainment was as Barnum created it. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. So I didn't have that, what, you know, reaction, because I was ready for it, because they told me their intention. And that's the big piece that we always go back to. What is the intention? So go to the movie, enjoy it, then come to the museum and learn the real history. <laughs> we're there. But with that, uh, yeah, we're doing a program this Sunday, a, a, a sad promo. Yes, the 28th, we're doing a fiction versus fact, the real story behind the real story, the R-E-E-L story. So we, I just, it was clever. So anyway, with that, I want to open the floor. We have a, a wonderful um, crescendo here. is going to talk about you know, a structure, the historic preservation, the preservation of that. And then Shana, of course, is the artist um, that we can talk about the humanity of, of who we are and how we're capturing that and how words are so powerful. And then, of course, we have the letters, the primary sources that are giving us the opportunity to tell the stories through the memories and the eyes of people's hearts and soul and loved ones. And then, of course, storytelling unto itself. How do you, t how do you become courageous enough to take the harder told story, the stories of valor and sacrifice that we don't talk about in textbooks and give people the opportunity to tell them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maisa. Do I, do you want... All right, so as um, I speak, you'll see some slides in the background. All of these slides tell a story. They all pose questions, and they also have the kernels of answers. And so what am I going to talk about today? Who knows? Um, Keith made me cry. Shauna made me cry. It's lucky if I can put my thoughts together. <laughs> but Mary and Eliza are 170 years old, the houses are, and they look it. They look 170 years old, which is why the preservation is so important. Why should they be preserved? Because they tell a story. But they told a story that only some of us could hear. Some of us could hear it so clearly that when we walked the sidewalk, we stopped. 
we looked and we listened. And this is what happened to Charles Brilvich, who was the um, city historian. He found himself one day stopping in the Cuban cleaners that was on the front, um, cobbled on the front of one of the houses, and he needed his pants hemmed. And he looked behind the cleaners and he thought, these houses are old. These houses are really, really old. They were old indeed. He did his research and what did he find out? He found out that these structures, the, o the only structures remaining of a pre-Civil War community of free people of color, first called Ethiop, they referred to themselves as Liberia, which means free land. In the 1820s, actually just before Bridgeport even became a city, they staked ground on the southern part of the city of what is now the city of Bridgeport. And they said, this is free land. Why is that significant? It's important because in Connecticut in the 1820s, slavery still existed. And it didn't officially end until 1848, the year that Mary and Eliza, two entrepreneurial women, real estate developers, chefs, people who trained other women and invented a mortgage system to help other people have land, they built these houses. Now, it was part of a larger community. It had Bridgeport's first free lending library. It had a luxury resort for wealthy blacks from New York City. It had a couple of churches. The oldest church in Fairfield County still stands in this community. And they challenged. They challenged all the powers that could be. You have to realize that during the time that they lived and their fathers lived, more than half of the clergy in Connecticut owned people. They owned people. They forced them into bondage to do their work. The story that these houses tell is one that's not much thought of. Why is it important that we know that there was the seafaring community of free people of color? Why is it important that we know that they asked for in investment from other similar communities all around the Atlantic? They asked them to come to Bridgeport, what is now Bridgeport, invest, live. Why is it important to know that African and Native American people answered this call and actually invest it? Why the nephew of the Emperor of Haiti settled and created a business? Why people came from Cape Verde? Why they came from Jamaica? Why they came from Latin America, from Canada, and from the entire East Coast? And then why people came to seek freedom and why they weren't asked, were they slave or were they free? This community prospered. Well, it tells a story that is really important to us in modern days because everybody thinks they know the story of black people. They know the story of American Indian people, of Pagusset people. And because we think we know the story of these peoples, we think we know what people deserve what rights people have, how hard they worked, whether they should have a say in the culture that exists on the land that they occupy, whether they own the houses, whether they rent the houses, what they're worthy of. In a place like Fairfield County, which is always among one of the three richest counties in the nation, where the cities are almost always on the list of the poorest cities for their size. We need to tell this story because African American and Native American children who still live in Connecticut need to look and be proud of who they are. They draw resilience from the stories of their ancestors. We need to tell the story to all of Fairfield County because the idea that people are poor because they don't work, because they don't care. We also need to tell the story because we also can tell the story of immigrants who came to Bridgeport, who also made sacrifices and strides. And it also tells the story between race relations and, and the divvying up of resources in Fairfield County. So how do you tell a story? How do you make people care about a story? A story that shows up in the books of scholars, and actually Charles came up with a really nice cover. 
Charles Brilvich's book, how do we tell the story that's known to scholars in dissertations that are 500, 800 pages long? Well, you don't do it by handing a person an 800 page long dissertation, especially in a city that has a, a functional illiteracy rate among adults of 68%, and where most high school students graduate reading at a fourth grade level. How do you make people proud and care if they can't even read the history? Well, you reach out to your artists. There's a defining characteristic of all African American cultures, and that's that there's no, there's no separation between the arts and everyday life. Historically, that's been one of the defining characteristics of people of the African diaspora. So whether you're a lawyer or you're a farmer or you're an ordinary person, the arts are a part of everything that you do. And although there are people who are especially gifted of arts and their family and their lineage might have dedicated themselves to arts like the griots and the Senegambian um, traditions, Everyone partakes of the arts, and everyone sustains the artists, and everyone is sustained by their art. So we reached out. We reached out to artists. We put out a call to artists, and we said, we're going to put you together with historians to tell our story. And we looked high and low, and there was a very also sophisticated digital portal where people could submit their work, their portfolios, from all around the world. And we ended up with artists from everywhere, from Kenya, to the block next door. And they created work to tell chapters of this unknown chapter of American history. So the beautiful paintings that you see behind you, one of which is Shana's, are what they came out with to tell the story. So this exhibit has been mounted, half of the exhibit, because we ran out of money for the other half, at Housatonic Community College in partnership with the Housatonic Museum of Art. And half of the exhibit is mounted in, in the hallway. The other half, well, we'll get it up there. We'll get it up there just like we'll preserve these houses. So who tells the story? How do we become, make this a story that people tell? It has to be passed on not just in schools, but outside of schools. It has to be passed on both written and, and orally. Because if you think about the values and the aspects of our cultures that we cherish the best and the most, they're not necessarily the things that we saw written in school. They're the things that we were told again and again, whether they were true or false, but that the stories we heard told again and again. But speaking of hope, and the question that, was, that Keith was asked, what I find disconcerting are the stories of division. This story of, of Liberia, of little Liberia, of Ethiopia, it's compelling. And we have support from people in all different groups because the story of freedom, of women, of families who fight the odds, even the cautionary tales. When Mary, when Mary Freeman died, the only person in Bridgeboro who had more money than she was P.T. Barnum. She lost every penny. Her doctor stole it, forged a, forged a will. Cautionary tale. But what I find heartening in these times when people are being divided is that people of so many diverse backgrounds have stood up to say no. I grew up a child of the civil rights movement. I know what it's like to be in a line when most of the white people are on the other side of the police barrier and somebody starts trouble and the police beat up the people inside the police barrier. But when you see marches and you see people standing up, the difference between now and when I was a child is that people of all different colors are inside those police barricades, not just one color in and one color out. 
So the story, why this story is important is because it challenges the stereotypes and what people know. Black people in Bridgeport were not always poor. Black people in Bridgeport were made poor. Black people owned land and had that land one way or another taken away or disrespected. So as an organization, as a cultural organization, we're fighting for the ground, very literally, that we're on. We want the community to be able to control the programming that happens in those buildings. And if it means that it's going to be harder for us to get funds, well, I, well, let's hope it's not harder for us to get funds because we would like grassroots control of the content of this institution. So it's not a place where you make a place for diversity. It's a place where diversity dwells. It's a place that reflects the, the, um, the blocks around it. And as descendants of little Liberia settlers, and, and Keith is one, we want to have the right to determine the cultural footprint of the footprint of the original little Liberia. Does that mean that we just tell an African American story? We want to tell the story of the blue collar, of the working pe pe um, people, of the immigrant people, of, and the relationships between them, of the people who occupied those 12 blocks over time. We don't necessarily need to tell them ourselves, but we want control of the land which will allow us to tell the real story, show the real beauty of what is Bridgeport, what is the heart of Bridgeport. I'm a five-generation Bridgeport girl. I have the stories of not just myself, but of my grandmother, of my great-grandmother, of her mother and her mother. They were proud of the land where they lived. And they told us about the ups and downs. We want the right, we say we have the right to tell that story, even if we don't own the land. And so we're questioning a major tenet of society, of US society, that if you have the money, you, can call, you control the culture of that block. The developer can come in, buy the land, and destroy the culture. They can determine whether you hear about Keith's ancestors or not, just by owning the land. And that's the battle that we've been fighting. Um, and that's been sort of a, one of the hitches of developing the land is that we find that we have to be an advocate for the general welfare of people and for the right to play a part in civic society, to making sure everyone has that right. And also that basic needs are met after disasters like hurricanes. We were hit hard by um, yeah. Superstorm Sandy. Yeah, well, with, yeah, it was yeah. it was bad down by us. So but with that, I apologize. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So uh, so I'm gonna pass the mic, and um, I hope you enjoyed the slides, and you have some questions. Hi everybody. Um, so. It's weird coming after you, but I guess it's, it works. Um, <laughs> um, so my component is the importance of telling today's stories. I think a lot of times we focus, as we rightfully should, on the past um, and understanding and learning it, and it does affect our lives today. But who's gonna learn about today if we're not telling the stories of today? I think a lot of times we lose sight of the fact that we are creating the history that people will learn 50 to 100 years from now. Um, upon talking to David, I came up with a couple of quotes that I've always found relevant in my work. Um, one is by Zora Neale Hurston, and it says, if you do not talk about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. And then it's one by Maya Angelou, there is no greater burden than carrying an untold story inside of you. And so for the last 13 years, November made 13 years, 
I began a monthly, now I do it annually, an open mic series called Lyrical Voices. And in this open mic series, there are people of all cultures, all ages, all backgrounds, all neighborhoods, mostly from Bridgeport. And when I started this open mic, I was like, someone else is going to take it over, but I need a place to read because I'm kind of a poetry junkie. <laughs> and and um, I, we just need a space. And what it evolved into was a movement with an enormous crowd and people traveling from Rhode Island and New Jersey and Mississippi and North Carolina. I'm like, oh, this is different. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but it's been one of the most powerful journeys in my life. And what I found that was just like me was the need to tell your story, to share your art, to express yourself, to have your perspective heard and recognized. Because a lot of times we go through things and we think we're the only ones going through it. And then you hear the poem, or you hear the story, or you see the movie, and it's like, oh, it's not just me. I'm, oh, thank God, you, you know? And that's what art does. It connects people. I think a lot of times we do create it for ourselves, and we're apologetic for that. Um, but we don't need to be, because coming from the most honest part of yourself allows other people to tap into the most honest part of their selves. Um, so a lot of times you see programming geared towards kids, and I think that's important, but I don't do that. I love kids. I've worked with them for a very long time, but I think it's also important to put your programming towards adults, A, because we get caught up in bills and life and this mortgage and this rent and this car and that job and this and, and there's so many reasons, right? But we are the ones who are raising the kids and we want them to be expressive and we want them to be creative, but then we have a 100,000 reasons why we can't do it ourselves. And so when I go into my writer's group, which as mentioned, I, I host at City Lights Gallery, I've been doing my writer's group since 2005. And for the last three years consistently, thankfully, we've been doing it with City Lights. And at the very least, we have eight to 10 people. At the very mo low, most, we've had like 30. Poor Steve. You need another table, Shauna? Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's amazing because there's so much vulnerability and there's so much openness. And there's a fear of that very often, right? Where it's like, I don't want to tell this story about this person. And I don't want to say this about myself. And then you open up in a level that's scary. But oh boy, when you do it, how liberating it, it becomes. And then you hear other people in the room like, that happened to me too, or I understand, or I felt shame for that. And really, it's amazing seeing people in the community afterwards supporting each other and connecting and just being friends, you know, without motives, without agenda, just recognizing the light in one another. So when you talk about society versus personal stories, I was, so I was in this training for the reimagining Little Liberia, right? And I was blown away by the history. That history is something I hadn't heard before. Jermaine called me and connected me to this program. And my great grandmother was here and my, my parents grew up here and nobody heard about it. But one of the things that stood out to me was how the water at Seaside is, the way the ferry goes in and out, is actually the Underground Railroad. And I said, what? <laughs> because my church does the Ma'afa every year, and it's about the journey of African people from Africa through the Middle Passage to now. And I had the, the honor of creating it this year. But every year we do something called the release of the ancestors and we go to that water at like five in the morning when it's cold and we do a release because all of the ancestors who we called upon to tell their stories through the production, we release their energy back into the water at the break of dawn. And nobody knew that we were actually at the Underground Railroad. And when I got home from that training, I called Pastor Bennett and I called everybody in the church. I was like, did you know that? And, and nobody knew. And one of the things Pastor, Pastor D said was, it's amazing how they call us home, mm -hmm. right? We, none of us knew, but we were all there. We've gone a little like <laughs> yes. 
And, um, and it, was, it was so powerful to me. And so that is why it's important now. We're living in a generation or, or a time of, you know, a lot of division with government, with, with systems. But we're also living through a time of unity. And if you look back at some of the most relevant stories in history, they're personal ones. And they're how people felt at that time. And they're what people thought at that time and what they saw. And if somebody were to talk about now, they'd say it was so racially divided. But in real life, right, we're, we share the same spaces. We do work together. We support each other. And it's not always coming down to that. It's coming down to humanity, necessity, and too often capitalism. And there's a lot of other elements that come in to why people connect to each other. So. For me, I do this writer's group, and I do my poetry, and I do all of these things because of the human connection. Because 50 years from now, when people talk about Bridgeport, I want them to talk about the artist. I want them to talk about the community. I want them to talk about the, the reimagining and restoration of Little Liberia. I want them to talk about how prayerfully we get our school systems back on track. I want them to talk about the good that's happening. Because if you go by other people's interpretation, right, the, the idea that people who don't live in your space, in your life, in your experience, have of you, and you never tell the truth, you're, you're left vulnerable to what people think instead of what you know is true. And so that's why I do my writer's group. That's why I do my poetry. And that's why I go into spaces and share, and I find projects, and I encourage other people to do the same. Because if you don't tell it, somebody will. And it needs to be honest. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, and I want to uh, say thank you, David, for making me a playwright, because I'm actually a semi-playwright. <laughs> Everything I do is based on original letters from World War II, and I'm going to digress a minute. Uh, is, is my friend still here who went to Clemson, visited Clemson University? I have one letter from Clemson College, and I'm going to quote it for you, and you may borrow it. <laughs> Dear Eva, what a beautiful name. How harmonious. How melodic. I know you think I'm giving you a line, but my hand writes what my heart dictates. At the end of the letter, he said, did you say something about a party? <laughs> um, my mother died on Mother's Day 2001, and she died in the farmhouse in which she was born in Easley, South Carolina, uh, which is not far from Clemson. And um, I found a bunch of letters, and then more letters, and then more letters, and more letters. And the first one I found troubled me. It was from a Mrs. Leach. And she wrote, to, she sent a mimeographed letter to the officers of the A-53rd Engineers Aviation Battalion. And she said, on December the 28th, I received a telegram from the War Department stating that my husband, Fred H. Leach, had been missing in action since November the 26th in the North Africa area. She goes on to describe it, what she knew. I'm eagerly seeking information pertaining to this tragedy, and if you can help me, my deepest appreciation will be offered. I hope from the bottom of my heart that your news was more pleasant than ours. My mother responded to her within a few days, and she said that she lives on the last words her husband wrote in a letter of November the 17th. If I don't come back, keep your chin up, and perhaps it will help others to do so. That must have been just before they were moved. Sincerely, Mrs. Leach. I'm going to ask the audience a question. Who in the audience has heard of the tragedy of the HMT Rona? And Karen, you don't count. It's my friend from WNPR. There's a very strong connection to Connecticut. 
The HMT Rona is the worst at sea disaster in American history, and no one has ever heard of it. HMT stands for His Majesty's Transport. On November the 26th, 1943, the Rona was part of a convoy on its way to what is called the CBI, the China Burma India Theater. The largest contingent on the Rona was the 853rd Engineers Aviation Battalion. My Uncle Bill and Lieutenant Leach were officers in the 853rd. It was a new unit that was formed in the summer of 1943 in Dyersburg, Tennessee. The enlisted men came from Bradley Field. More than 1,100 US servicemen perished. They perished because the Nazis had started to experiment with something called the Hensel Glide Bomb. And on that day, the missile hit the Rona. It was classified for 50 years, so no one has ever heard of it. Uncle Bill survived, Lieutenant Leach did not. And if anybody had, in, had known about the, the Rona, I would have been shocked, because the only people who know about it are people like me who have a connection to it. So the, the letters that I inherited were so beautiful that I thought they should be turned into plays and programs. And over the years, people have lent me their letters. One was a lovely, lovely man named Bob Rosencrantz. His brother Herb was the firstborn son of Jews who came through Ellis Island as babies, Russia and Austria. The Greenwich Historical Society has just started an exhibit on the Jewish experience in Greenwich. Bob Rosencrantz was a longtime resident of Greenwich. I met, he sent me a very sweet thank you note. I met Bob at his home and he came out of the attic with a box and said, here, take this. The letters were so incredible, I turned it into a play called Dear Mom and Dad. And we did it first time performed at the Museum of American Jewish Military Experience. There is a perception that Jews have not served in the American military. That's not me speaking, that's the museum speaking. So over the years, the story is coming out. I want to, I hope that you will come. We'll be doing it in April. And I want just to read a short letter from Herb so that you'll understand the kind of man he was. December the 28th, 1944, this is the Battle of the Bulge, one of the most deadly battles in the war. I guess the recent news from the Western Front has caused you a great deal of anxiety. Well, it has me too. Yet despite our new problems, I take it as a good sign. For the first time since fighting the Jerry, I can see the end of the war close at hand. General Ike once described our job as one similar to pushing a heavy wagon up a hill during a blinding fog. It's rough, back-breaking work, but suddenly at unpredictable time, the top of the hill is reached. The wagon goes crashing down the other side. I have that home stretch feeling the top of the hill is not far off. We should get down on our knees and thank God every day for being born an American. I fight now to come home. I fight to deserve to come home. May God grant me that privilege. When you crack open that champagne bottle this New Year's Eve, look at each other and say, for Herb and victory, you know I'll be sitting there right beside you. Your loving son, Herb. Herb was killed two months later in Germany, He's trying to save his comrades. Does this letter sum up the valor of one fine Jewish soldier? and one fine American? I ask you, and I think you all know the answer. Are we supposed to make people cry? Is that, <laughs> I, I wasn't, I didn't get that memo. <laughs> um, David, if you don't mind, um, I think I'll save the video as you suggested originally for the end. Is that all right? Um, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Bonnie Levison. Um, 
one of my favorite quotes is an Indian proverb, and it goes like this. Uh, tell me a fact, and I'll learn. Tell me the truth, and I'll believe. But tell me a story, and it will remain in my heart forever. I love stories. Um, many years ago, I was uh, getting divorced. I was feeling very sorry for myself. And I was sick of feeling sorry for myself, so I did what every, anybody would do. I started to perform stand-up comedy. <laughs> it made perfect sense at the time. Um, and I wasn't very good at it, uh, but I will never forget my first time on stage in a darkened club with a light on me. And I told us, uh, it was sort of a story about going on horrible blind dates. And again, not very good, but there was my very first laugh. And I remember it was right there in the front, in the darkness, on the right. And I, I just will never forget that laugh, ever. I'm sure she was drunk, it's okay. <laughs> But I left that club and I thought, why do I feel so good? Because I wasn't that good. But I know what it was. It was that I connected. And from whatever depths of sorrow I was in, I had felt disconnected. And this idea of sharing something personal connected me with people. And then I was introduced to this something called The Moth, um, where I work today. Um, and uh, this organization, does anybody know of The Moth? A few people? Oh, fabulous. Great. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's a storytelling organization in New York, and we have shows all over the world, but we have weekly open mic nights, I gotta come to one of yours, um, in New York City where anybody can go put their name in a hat and get up and be challenged to tell a five minute true personal story. And uh, you are judged by the audience, which we love to do, we love to judge people, um, it's excellent. And. Uh, I went to my first night, I stood online, I wore black clothing, and I tried to look cool like I wasn't from Connecticut. And I, I went in and I was with 200 strangers and I heard stories that made me laugh and I heard, heard stories that made me cry and I heard stories that just made me think. And I thought, it's not about comedy, it's really about this connection because at the end of the night, I was by myself and I could talk to anyone in that room because these stories, no matter where we were from, connected us because they're all, a great story is just about the human experience. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not where you live or how you live. It's, it's those basic human emotions that we all share and we are desperate to connect and that is something that I experienced. So I, I started working for them and it's been about a decade now where I've had the great privilege of going out in the world and uh, working in a wide variety of communities to teach them what the moth has developed over 20 years, the art and craft of personal, true personal storytelling. And when we do this, we mean you get up on a stage all by yourself without any notes, a little, it's as naked as you can be basically, and you share your truth. And um, when I did comedy, you know, if anybody's been to a comedy club, you sort of sit back and go, yeah, if you're an audience, you know, make me laugh, just try. But when you go to a storytelling night or if you've ever been at a talk like today where someone's sharing their truth, you lean in and it's just a warm, beautiful hug. Anyway, so I've been teaching storytelling. Um, my very first workshop was with a, for a large company. I, I work in a wide variety. I work in prisons and high schools and nonprofits, but I also work for large companies. 80 people in a room, the end of the workshop, a, uh, a woman got up asking about the workshop and she, she turned around to the 80 people and she said, I have been working with all of you for eight years and after today, this day of sharing stories, I know you better than in all those eight years. Stories are powerful. I um, live in Greenwich, Connecticut and I had the honor of being on the board of the Greenwich Historical Society and our director of education, a fabulous woman, Anna Greco is here. I hope she'll raise her hand there. Um, she produces a, a twice a year storytelling night. We decided, let's, you know, history is, as you mentioned, Maisa, is that how you say your name? Um, said, you know, history is being made now. We're making history right now. Let's record it. Let's hear it. Um, and so let's tell the stories of today because they are the history of tomorrow. So we have had a storytelling night called the Story Barn, and you're going to see um, we have a beautiful barn on our campus, um, and we bring people in our community together, and we, uh, they get a theme, and they get to be inspired um, by that theme to tell a personal story, and they get about five minutes to tell that story. We care a lot about time, so Karen, you have to tell me if I'm going over time. Um, that's me um, hosting the night, but um, we have had people from all walks of life in the Fairfield County area 
sharing stories um, about their lives. And we've had some, I will say, they are not just historical stories, they are, we've had some, we just had, our last one was about, inspired by the exhibition, the Jewish exhibition, and Anna came up with a great name, Oy Vey. Which, by the way, I did not know this means woe is me. I thought it was like, oh my God. No, it's woe is me. So um, we had a fellow um, talk about being a stripogram for the first time. Um, uh, we, we have people talk about growing up. We've had local legislators talk about growing up in Greenwich. We've had people who grew up in the 50s trying to buy the Beatles pants on our old Main Street and what it looked like. Um, and is that my time? Okay, so that's what we do, and if anybody, I was gonna talk quickly about what makes a great story, but we do have a little video. Yes, quickly? Yeah, Sorry. Right. Um, three main things that make a great story according to the moth um, theme. It, the theme of your story is not what happens in a story, it's what the story's really about. So you might hear a story about somebody, um, you know, jumping out of a plane, but the story actually might, the theme of the story is what is important, and that might be midlife crisis. Um, and so the theme of your story is your editor. You stick to that theme. The stakes of a story. Why do you care? Why is this story important to you? If this story, if you don't set up why you care and what matters to you in telling this story, in the beginning of your story, the audience will not care either. So you need to really set up what, what is at stake for you in telling this story. Um, finally, the arc of a story. Everyone's heard about a story arc. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and end. It is a challenge to find where you begin and end your story because we have a lifetime of experiences to include in our stories. Um, but really, you really want to know where you start that story and you want to memorize your ending because that's where you leave your audience. And ultimately, the story arc is about transformation. As you heard in all of Keith's beautiful stories, it was all about transformation and that's what you remember. An anecdote is a cool thing that happened. But, and a story is not, I was great, something great happened and I'm still great. That's not a story. You have to have transformation in your stories. And in your organizations, stories are going to connect us in our communities. And so I'd like to sh close with a little video that I think sums it up. You know me, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this happened in September. <laughs> Filibustering. <laughs> uh, it, it is, is, I guess, a, a smaller uh, point, but a profound one, uh, that I tried to reinforce with my staff at every level of my public work and, and continue to do to this day. Uh, I actually think organizing, mobilizing, starting movements uh, starts with a story. And you can't create a story that moves large numbers of people unless you are able to listen and hear to the story of the person next to you, uh, the story of your neighbors, the stories of your coworkers, the stories of your community, um, the story of people who are not like you. And so uh, one, of, one of the things that I think is, is important is for us to learn how to uh, listen to each other and learn how it is that we came to be who we are, think, uh, the way we do, um, because that understanding of other people's stories is how you end up ultimately uh, forging bonds and creating the glue that creates movements. Um, you know, uh, every great movement, if you think about Gandhi in, in India, uh, it started with his understanding of India's story and his own story and seeing Indians in South Africa discriminated against. and recognizing that there were traditions and myths and a power in those stories that ended up uh, driving out the most powerful empire on earth. Um, you really want me to cut off Barack Obama? <laughs> really? <laughs> Thank you all. So we only have a couple of minutes left, and um, I just want to open it to the floor, but bounce my 
thought, when I listen to all of my colleagues speak, it all comes uh, down to the human journey, the human experience, and we all are connected through that way if we have enough courage uh, to face it and allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Um, and certainly with the Freeman Houses, which are an absolutely extraordinary story and how Maisa fights this fight on and on. I mean, it's resilience, it's perseverance because this is too important. And I'm humbled uh, every time I, I watch and say, why is it this important? But making sure that we don't give up those crusades to tell these magnificent stories through the arts, through storytelling. So with that, if anybody has any questions for our panel, today, or if anybody wants to just sum up. Uh... Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I know a lot about grants um, is about keeping track of everything, and I'm so inspired by stories and really believe in the power of um, like the, for lack of a better word right now, softer skills of being able to uh, connect and be real. And I'm wondering when working on projects um, where storytelling is essential, um, how any of you talk to people who need to like, keep track of like success in a way that um, is tangible and how, like if you're working with institutions that are more aren't for the like connecting and people skills. Um, I'm not sure if you're understanding what I'm trying to ask with this. Do any of you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. are you, I believe are you, she's are saying, you saying, how do you quantify the success of a project when it relies on people participation and sharing? How do we how do we relate to to more um, traditional um, funding sources? Is that what you're saying? Sure, and I, I guess um, well, yeah. When when things are formed, you could go with that. I know there's not that much time, so I feel like anything you say will be valuable. <laughs> so so really quickly, one of the ways that I I see our success. So for example, this is a um, a book a journal called Corridor. And it was put together by an architect and his brother who grew up in um, Fairfield, okay? And riding back and forth all the time from New York City, um, he came to wonder why people weren't talking about the places in between the big places. And, and through a, a number of conversations, he became very interested in telling the stories of Bridgeport. So you have an architect who decides he's gonna talk about architecture of the places in between, but discovers the stories. So there are stories of the arts, there are stories of the story of Little Liberia, all of these by an architect and his brother who put together a journal and their goal is to tell the story of all of the in-between places. So that they have a spread on Little Liberia, on the Freeman houses, and all of the things, many of the things that we spoke about in Bridgeport it tells me that that's success. Now, is that success um, measured by maybe the foundations that gave us money? Does this get on our report somehow? I have to figure out how to do that. But, but what has been a success for us are all the connections that we made. So in a city like Bridgeport, it might not be easy to reach over traditional barriers, but that I, that Kathy um, housed our um, workshop for our scholars when our first place fell through, that Housatonic stepped in as a partner and gave us a venue, a place to hang our paintings. I mean, that is success. That it takes more time than maybe a foundation thought it, it might. Well, it's not as easy for us to find a venue to get the artist, to get the art on the wall to tell this story. But that we did that, I guarantee that's maybe more of a success than just hanging up artwork in a gallery that already exists. And, and we also now have built a rapport that will help move the cultural 
the culture within the city that Shauna was talking about um, across barriers, it, it brings us all together, and, and that's that's worth more than than money. For for what it's worth, we work with organizations, and I highly recommend for all of you who are involved with organizations to collect your stories somehow. You know, keep records of them because they will become useful. Um, and uh, I, I worked one of the first large companies I worked with, uh, the, the gentleman who was the head of marketing changed his name from S -Vice, Senior Vice President of Marketing to Senior Storyteller. Um, and he became, it became his job to keep a library of the success stories of the organization. If, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, I, I, don't, I don't know, but as a personal way of documenting what I do, and so success is relative, right? Everybody in here might have a different perspective on who is successful and why. So really all you have control over is making sure people know what you do, when you do it, and where you're doing it, and how it went, right? So that's where social media comes in. That's where making sure you take pictures comes in. That's where blogging comes in, posting comes in. That, that becomes your resume. Let me tell you, in the last year, I have tried for so much thing, so many things. Literally, a whole grant was removed from the face of the earth after a year of working on it. A man died at the same time I was calling him for an opportunity. Everything I tried failed epically. Everything I didn't try to do was phenom phenomenal. I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting awards. I'm going to like receptions. I'm performing. It's crazy, and none of it, everything I tried would have been great. Everything I didn't try was even greater, and I didn't do anything for it. But you know what got me in those places? My website, my presence in the community, my Instagram posts, my, my hey guys, I'm here, come be with me, my writer's group, those things. You can't control what people think is successful, but what you can control is how much access they have to what you create. And so I think that's the... We actually... Um the name of our um, education person, our social media education person. Her title is uh, Curiosity Correspondent. So it's sometimes it's just in the words you use that shift your behavior, that shift your thinking. So with that, if there's not another question, I think our time is up. Thank you all.